Hello, everybody. This is a little odd. My name is Stacy Higginbotham. I am the host of the Internet of Things podcast and the creator of the Stacy on IoT website. And I hope I am not talking into the void. You are here because you signed up for our webinar on how the Internet of Things, or why didn't the Internet of Things predict COVID-19? And I, I did this because actually a doctor who listens to the show sent me a message and he was like, why didn't we see this coming? We have lots of connected devices, wearables, and connected therm thermometers and nothing. And I was like, well, it's probably because we weren't looking for it. But I was like, that's actually a really good question. So I wanted to ask all these smart people, and this is really an extension of the reporting that I do every day. I just thought it'd be fun to share their, their unedited thoughts with everyone. So my panelist is Inder Singh. He is the CEO of Kinza. Wave hi. <laughs> Um, oh, and I got a I got a message from someone saying I wasn't talking to the void. So exciting! Uh, our other panelist is Dr. Jennifer Radin. She is from <laughs> Scripps Digital Trans. I always mess this up. Translational Institute, <laughs> and Dina Mendelson, who is from Electra Labs, and this is a company that tests consumer wearables for clinical trials. And the idea is we can be like, hey, here are people who are looking for disease to begin with. Here's an epidemiologist who is ready to talk about how we do this. And then we've got Dina here who's talking about how good our devices are and have to be to make this happen. So, yay, panelists, let's kick it off with our first question. Why didn't we see this coming? You wanna go, Inder? Sure, um, we did. We did see it coming. And the sad fact is we weren't listening or we weren't proactively using the data that was suggesting it was coming. Um, so let me take a step back and say, you know, in any epidemic, in my mind, there's a four part response, early warning, widespread testing, treatment and isolation, including contact tracing. And of course you have to confer immunity to the population, vaccine development, or antibody testing. What's missing or what had been missing from the world is a true real time early detection system. It's what we've been working on for eight years now. And we have one. And I'm just going to show you what we've been doing really fast. So this is healthweather.us. We launched it on March 18th. What it shows is fever levels across the country, fever levels from uh, about a million and a half connected thermometers and that we, that we make. Uh, specifically, what it shows is unusual fever levels across the country, fever levels that go above and beyond what you'd ordinarily expect from cold and flu season in that particular area. In other words, it's an unusual outbreak. Today, that's COVID-19. And I remember being on the phone with someone on March 14th, and you know, I, I, we, looked at, we looked at our atypical illness, the unusual illnesses that were across the country on March 14th. And we were like, whoa, something's hitting. So we jumped on the phone with an advisor, Dr. Nirav Shah, former New York State Health Commissioner, and we showed him the data. He said, whoa, <laughs> let me call my colleagues. The former head of the FDA um, jumped on, one of the former heads of the FDA jumped on the phone and another uh, prominent public health official jumped on the phone. And they looked at it and they said, listen, what you're showing us makes sense. There's science here, but I'm not sure if it's credible because what we're seeing is hot spots in the Northeast and Florida and we haven't seen case build up there. Three days later, we started seeing cases and my team said, okay, we need to get this information out there. And we launched healthweather.us in under 48 hours. Let's show a little bit about what we saw as an example um, here. Let's pop this up. This is New York City. This in blue is the Kinsa atypical illness signal, the fevers that are not associated with cold and flu. If you push that back 18 days, it matches up with the New York City death curve almost perfectly. <laughs> you data geeks out there, the R squared is above 0 0.92. And you see this phenomenon many, many, many places across the country. We have an early warning system and it's coming in the form of syndromic surveillance. That's the term that public health officials use. I hate using the term uh, surveillance. I think I use the term early warning. 
because the connotations around that word. But we, we're basically taking symptom data from people in their homes and mapping it. And, and we do now have an early warning system. We need to make sure we trust it and we need to make sure we use it to respond. And that's, that's the current situation. Okay. And along the lines of trusting it, Dina, do you want to talk about how, well, your take on why we didn't see this coming, or since Inder said we did, um, how we build these kind of trusted devices out in the field? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that my opinion does, it kind of overlapped with Inder. We did have enough signals before March that we could have seen it coming if we were paying attention to the information that we had available to us. At the same time, because COVID-19 is by definition so novel, to date, no tech gadget has been found to be the magic bullet for tracking or monitoring COVID-19. So the Kinsen thermometer is a great example. A fever is present in many of the cases of COVID-19, but it's not present in all of them. And so we're looking at additional technology like pulse ox measures and things like that which work, but we don't know in what cases is actually relevant for COVID-19. And so at Electra Labs, even before COVID-19, we were thinking about how to make sure that the connected health technology that people use um, not only worked, but was appropriate for the intended use case. Uh, COVID-19, that was not the intended use case of a lot of the technology that was available before March and still today. And so when we continue to rely on biometric monitoring technology, there are four things that we at Electro Labs are thinking about and we would encourage others to think about as well. And so the first is, does this technology record uh, or record accurate measurements? So it's not helpful if the technology produces measurements that actually are not correct. The second is whether it's measuring relevant information. And so that goes back to trying to figure out which symptoms or vital signs are actually relevant to spotting COVID-19 and which ones are not. The next one is, um, can individuals use the technology appropriately at home or wherever they are? And then we're also thinking, you should also think about the distribution of this technology. So if we were to see hotspots in certain areas, we should consider whether technology may not be available in other areas. And for that reason, we're not gonna see the hotspot there, but it doesn't mean that we're not having a COVID-19 outbreak in that location. And then the last thing to consider is whether there are potential differences for how home measurement tools work compared to tools used in traditional clinical settings. So we might think of a pulse oximeter where people can use Fitbit and Garmin fitness trackers to look at their blood oxygen saturation and the way that that's going to measure it will be different from how it's measured in traditional clinical setting. And so it doesn't mean that one is better than the other one, but it does mean that we need to be aware of how this information is being measured. And then when we're talking with our clinicians, make sure that we report to them what we're using to do these measurements to figure out what's going on. Okay, and Dr. Radin, you are an epidemiologist and y'all are super popular nowadays. So what do you look for when you're looking for an outbreak? I mean, is it enough to say for, you know, Endure to call you up and be like, hey, we've got all these atypical flu spikes, or what does that look like from your perspective? Yeah, I think um, Endure's data and other data streams are great for kind of giving us this early warning that something is out of the ordinary. So maybe someone who is in that particular area where they're experiencing a red hot spot that public health officials should investigate, potentially identify what's the atypical um, illness that's happening. How is it different than say other, is it a flu? Is it a typical respiratory illness that's occurring or is it something totally new out of the ordinary? So as Inder said, that will require laboratory testing to identify kind of what's actually circulating and um, also it, 
requires having good baseline to understand, is this typical? Is this um, tracking with um, kind of a normal flu season trend or is this um, an increased rate that um, we wouldn't expect to see? So epidemiology is always about looking at the person, place and time. So are we seeing extra cases in a certain place that are happening kind of outside of an abnormal time that we would see them? Okay. And we're going to talk about our, our efforts now to track COVID-19, like where we are. But first, a couple of y'all, y'all have all mentioned this idea of a baseline. And I think it's probably important just to, to figure out how you can establish a really good baseline, given the fact that, you know, I am a super healthy person who loves wearing my Fitbit. Uh, Kinza, the, they've got two thermometers. One is very, pretty accessible but still not everybody has one. So how do you bring technology out into the world in a way that can help us establish a statistically valid baseline? And I don't know, who wants to jump in? Yeah, for um, our study, so we launched a study called DETECT, um, which harnesses um, wearable device data. So in the United States, one out of five Americans um, currently wears a smartwatch or an activity tracker. So we're pulling in data from devices that a huge population across the U.S. and globally are currently wearing in the growing population. And um, so our study works on by um, tracking and identifying each individual's kind of typical norm. Um, so my resting heart rate might be totally different from your resting heart rate. So one person's abnormal might be someone else's normal. And being able to compare each person to themselves and have a good individual baseline too enables us to identify kind of subtle trends that may um, indicate someone's coming down with an illness and um, potentially identify um, a viral illness onset even before um, symptoms start appearing. And certainly at the population level, be able to look at trends and identify trends um, before um, traditional data um, surveillance data streams are identifying them. So in the United States, um, influenza-like illness surveillance is often delayed by one to three weeks. So getting these real-time data streams from things like um, Endure's um, project and ours enables us to um, figure out what's happening a lot faster so that we can enact um, public health measures to help control um, local outbreaks before they spread. Okay, we'll talk about detect in a second because we, we need to. But Inder, you have done something pretty cool about getting everybody access, or maybe not everybody, but a wide portion of a population access to your thermometers. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so I agree with Jennifer, right? Um, you need to have, listen, by the time someone enters the healthcare system, it's too late. If you look at COVID-19 specifically, it's two weeks before people are entering the healthcare system where their symptoms are severe enough. It's too late. With you know, massive growth rates, with r naught. everybody's heard of r naught now, so I'll just use the, the term from epidemiology, with r naughts that can be six plus in certain locations, depending on the context, and we're talking about massive spread of illness. And so being able to talk to someone in their home before they ever touch the healthcare system, within hours of symptom onset, is what you need to do to detect, you know, to detect where and when illness is spreading. None of this is rocket science. If you want to know where and when illness is spreading, you have to know where and when symptoms are starting. If you want to know how fast it's spreading and therefore what percentage of the population is likely to get it and who's like, you have to know how fast it's spreading in the home, the school, and the workplace, the primary nodes of disease transmission. If you want to know how bad it's getting, you've got to map how long lasting it is and how severe the symptoms are. This is not rocket science. This is the kind of work that Jennifer and, and us have been doing. We've been doing this for eight years, right? Our mission from inception has been to, tr to uh, curb the spread of infectious illness through earlier detection and earlier response. And that is rooted in my background in infectious disease and public health before starting cancer. And if you really want to detect illness early, you have to be in the right populations. Our data is biased. It is biased towards spreader populations. Larger families spread disease more. 
They get sick more. Anyone who's a parent knows this. You, you carry virus in your home only to infect others. Underserved communities spread disease more. It is not their fault. They don't have access to care and treatment. If you do not have a sentinel network in the underserved community, you will not detect illness spread. Um, and the third is first responder families, right? First responders are masters of germ-free interaction, but if they spread it to the family, you can be sure they're gonna spread it to the community, right? They're masters of germ-free. We've spent the last eight years optimizing against this. So we give away thermometers for free to Title I schools across the country. We've given it away to more than 200,000 households. We're gonna be giving away another three or 400,000 thermometers um, uh, this fall. And right now, five states were working with the deploy smart thermometers at scale, mostly to the underserved communities. Again, if you don't know what's happening in these large multi-generational communities, large multi-generational families that hold virus, right? There's a lot of articles out there that talk about how COVID is gonna hide in a family or it's gonna hide in a small community of people that are interacting with each other, being passed around mildly symptomatically or asymptomatically to others who don't help the healthcare system only to cause a flare up. You can't create a sentinel network in those populations. You've missed the boat. And so we've been trying to optimize against that for years. And that's why the data is so powerful. Dina, I always find it really helpful in a conversation amongst panelists to disagree. It just makes it more fun. So respectfully, I am going to strongly disagree with your, your statement here and tell you that there's already one Harvard study and there's about to be five independent universities that are going to verify that as far as we can tell, Kinsa is the only effective early leading indicator. It gives you almost three weeks for COVID-19 spread in the community. Wait three weeks and you'll see all that come out. Okay, I would be remiss if I did not let Dina respond. Go for it, Dina. <laughs> Um, I bet I didn't realize that I had said that there were many other um, competitors to Kinza that's doing a great job monitoring it. I think there are some, um, but Kinza certainly does do strong work in getting into communities and identifying whether a flare up. Um, one thing that I did notice that um, my co-panelists didn't mention is that, of course, Electro Labs is very supportive of biometric monitoring technology. That's what we work on. Um, but we need to acknowledge the severe limitations and privacy protections over Americans' health information. So right now, COVID-19 is just one example, but this has been a problem that existed long before. There are two laws that are introduced in Congress to address that gap, but in the meantime, Americans who may otherwise be interested in contributing their data uh, for the greater good may hesitate before using that available technology and for a good reason. Okay, we are gonna get to privacy, but I, lo I love how you're like, yeah, I see your, I see your disagreement with a privacy violation. Uh, we'll talk about it. But first, Jennifer, I've gotta give you a chance because we haven't actually explained to people what detect is. And I, I think we've kind of talked around it, but you're the creator of this program and, and talk to us about what it's doing and why you've picked the metrics that it's following. Yeah, so um, it was based off a study that I did using um, 200,000 Fitbit users who wore their device um, consistently for a period of two years. And when someone gets sick, their resting heart rate typically increases compared to their average resting heart rate, and they likely are less active, their sleep may become disrupted. So if we're able to harness kind of this large scale data that um, from wearables, we can look at um, population level changes. So if um, a large proportion of um, an area is seeing um, an increase in resting heart rate and changes in sleep and activity. Um, we found that that can um, help us predict real time influenza like illness um, activity level. And so our study, we looked at the state level and we found that this Fitbit variable significantly improved our predictions in all, all the states that we looked at. So DETECT is kind of the next step on that study. We're um, prospectively enrolling participants who consent to join and share their data through our app, which is called My Data Helps. And the participants can share um, any wearable device data that's um, connected to either Google Fit or Apple Health Kit. So we're device agnostic. 
and participants, when they get sick, they can share um, symptom data. So if they come down with um, a fever or a cold, any other respiratory symptoms, they can report that through our app. They can report diagnostic test results. And they also have the option to share electronic health records. So this is a way for us to validate that the changes in the sensor data that we're seeing are actually um, associated with viral illness onset. And what um, prior studies have shown is that this resting heart rate is really an early warning signal and might actually even start to rise before temperature and fever onset. And so we think um, this may be a great tool and data stream to both identify um, individual level um, illness onset, but also really look at the population level and create just kind of a, a framework and um, a, um, a platform where we can um, track viral illness. So we're interested in looking at coronavirus, but also um, seasonal flu and any other viral um, illness that um, is important to track. And so we're hoping that this platform that we create will be useful for many years to come. Okay, so I download my, or I download the app, I tie my data or my device to it, mm -hmm. and then you're looking for changes in my heart rate, my sleeping to predict any illness, any viral illness, not just COVID-19. Yes, um, of course, we're very interested in coronavirus right now since it's on everyone's mind. But yeah, it, we are hoping to look at flu and other respiratory viruses as well. And we're comparing each person to themselves. So by tracking, say, your data over time, we get um, a better and better idea of what your typical values are so that when we start to see changes that are outside of the normal, um, that those may indicate something's going on with your health. I'm like, it might just indicate, oh, Stacy had too much to drink last night, or mm -hmm. she's, she's coming down with something. Okay, so now that we know this, and this is opt-in, I want to make that really clear to everybody. Let's, let's talk about privacy. I know Inder said he did not like the idea of calling it surveillance. I can't remember what warm and friendly term you used. What was it? Early warning. Early warning. All right, early warning. But I, I've talked to people in... in this is kind of a form of benign surveillance. It could be non-benign. How should we think about protecting people's privacy around their medical data? Because this is, it's truly scary to think that, you know, my boss might know that I'm getting sick before I do, or maybe that I have a hangover before, <laughs> or just in general. So I want to open that up. Dina, I know you worked with a consumer's union. Let's start with you to set the baseline, actually. Uh, thank you. So when I was at Consumer Report, Consumer Union, and still now, something that we think about a lot is the fact that the really the only law that people are aware of that protects their health is HIPAA, which is not actually a health privacy law. And much of the information that's gathered about individuals now that relates to their health comes outside of what HIPAA would cover. And so one example, since we're talking about kids and not to call them out, is uh, the thermometer. It creates um, some very helpful information. It identifies when you've been sick, it tracks your temperature, and none of this is covered by HIPAA. And so uh, when you're thinking about on a global scale, if it's going to be combined with uh, thousands or millions of other points of information in an aggregate, uh, you, may, you may assume that it's probably not going to become harmful. But if it becomes individualized, then there are ways that your health information can hurt you. It can hurt a person in the financial sector. You may have trouble getting life insurance, getting disability insurance, and it could infect you in the employment context. So what we need is we need our lawmakers to come together and create comprehensive data protection so that individuals can participate in early monitoring programs and know that their contribution to the public health is not going to create an individual harm. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let anyone, Inder, would you like to talk about your version of privacy and what that looks like? <laughs> I would love to. And, and here's, I would love to, and this is, I'm very passionate about this. So I, I want to be clear. You can have both. You can have perfect personal privacy protections and and you can have access to information on, for example, what's going around your community, 
for yourself, for your community, for your healthcare system, and for your government. You can have both. It is not a balancing act. It is not an equation. You can have 100% of both. We have the ability to design these technologies today. Yeah, and yeah, just I'm going to jump in and say I completely agree. And this is why it's about data rights and not about privacy. And individuals need to know this. And some companies are going to create data rights as part of their product, and other companies aren't. I, I agree with that. I mean, but, but let's be clear like, when you're talking about population level inferences, at the percentage of people ill in a geography, like Jennifer, and like we are doing, you're, you, it's not possible to identify an individual. You cannot identify an individual from healthweather.us. You're talking about the percentage of people ill in a county. We are not talking about personal data. We're not talking about de-identified data. We're not talking about metadata about a user. We're talking about a population level inference. You know, we, we've taken a stance on our work where we don't even share de-identified data. We've shared de-identified data four times in our entire existence, and those are all with researchers to publish papers in the science. And when we do that, we're very, very particular about putting clauses in that you're not allowed to combine those data sets or attempt to re-identify it. Because everyone knows who's worked in technology, you, if, with enough effort, you can re-identify almost any de-identified data set, even though you're allowed to share it. And by the way, the, the large healthcare companies do this a lot, right? And they do it under HIPAA regulations. But you can re-identify any de-identified data set. So we're really careful about not doing that because trust is paramount. So what I would say in terms of policy is one, there should be regulation. There needs to be tactical regulation on these points, but there needs to be intelligent regulation. We need to differentiate and we need our legislators to differentiate between personal data and population level inferences. When we start conflating the two, we run into a lot of problems that are gonna prevent us from detecting the next outbreak. Second, user watchdogs are critical. You need user watchdogs to be watching this and making sure that people are doing right by this. Whether there's watchdog organizations or individuals. So th those are my approaches to the policy here because listen, we're in the middle of a crisis. People are trying to respond. Everyone is trying to figure out a solution here. And it's not pretty. It's not going to be pretty. We need to find a way to response, to, to, to respond. But in the process of doing that, I think it's important to have tactical approaches to regulations and laws, not blunt force hammers. Because if we do that, we will stifle the ability to respond. We've got to be thoughtful. I'm going to let other people, like Dina, Jennifer, would you like to respond here? I'll just say for our study, it's uh, an IRB approved study and each individual opts in. They go through a consent process and um, they have the option to share as much or as little data as they want through our research study. I have always been a fan of the IRB approach to individual data, especially it being able to, having some sort of body, a watchdog say, hey, this is real important. This is important to people. This is their lives. And this sort of data should be handled with care in a way that you would handle like a human studies kind of thing. Um, so I am, I'm glad that you've got that involvement there. Dina, any follow, any final thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to hear all the things that Endure and Kinsa are doing to respect the data rights of individuals. I do agree that there's a difference between your individual information and the population information, and that if everybody gets nervous about sharing any of their information, we're not going to be able to do the type of monitoring that we need to do to protect the public health. The idea behind comprehensive data right legislation is to set just a framework to make sure that it isn't just companies who are thinking ahead like Kinsa that are doing the right thing is that all the companies are starting, are agreeing to follow the same game plan, the same game rules. And by doing that, consumers can enter the marketplace and pick between the product based on what the product does without having to second guess it and, or maybe decide that they don't want to opt in in the first place because it's just too complicated. And so organizations like Consumer Reports provide a really important function of looking over the privacy practices of devices that they are reviewing. But the fact is that even an organization like Consumer Reports or any other testing one, it is not able to keep up with the amount of technology that we have available to us these days. And so we need to have government come in 
and again, just create the rules that make a basic even playing field so that consumers can participate and so that the public can benefit from all that participation. Stacey, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I'm really delighted that Apple and Google are taking the approach they are. My limited understanding is they are meeting those principles of individual privacy and at the same time uh, access to information. Uh, and I just want to applaud that effort based on the, 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 what I've seen or heard from that, because I think that is a scalable, good solution that meets both the privacy of the individual and really functions effectively in a crisis like this. So I wanted to call that out. Yep, yep. They do seem to be very conscientious of all the privacy concerns that have been raised in the past. I, I, have, I have studied their documentation on this, and I agree. Um, it is possible to, like, really squeeze that data and figure this out, but that's, there is no perfect solution, I think, from de-identification. But we're going to move on from privacy, because I know we could talk about this all day long and never agree. But let's talk about pulling all of this together and building a forward-looking system that actually that can make a difference and anticipate maybe the next pandemic, help us with COVID-19 now. It is awesome that Kinza is you know, providing these thermometers. I always want to say thermostats, but awesome that you're providing these thermometers to as many people as possible. It is awesome that we're having, you know, I can participate in a study, but there has to be a unification, a public health response. And I would love to get your take on how to bring all this technology in a way that helps governments or mostly governments take action, because this is kind of a government, this is where governments need to come into play, because I as an individual can only do so much. So I'm going to, Jennifer, let's start with you just for fun. Yeah, I think, um, of course, the more data streams that we bring together, the better our models and predict predictive ability will be. Um, I think the data streams from indoors, looking at temperature, complement also our wearable device data and um, potentially bringing those together would um, help rule out some false positives potentially from a resting heart rate that may be from um, someone as you said, having a glass of wine the night before. But um, I think also looking at symptom data, and um, I think a lot of um, symptoms can also help improve um, our modeling efforts. And I guess um, our um, project is um, open science. So we really want to share our findings and our data with um, both health public health officials and any other researchers out there that um, are interested in using our data to help respond to um, COVID and other seasonal flu or other outbreaks. Are they interested? I mean, are they asking for this from you? Yeah, we've gotten a lot of interest from um, um, public health officials and um, government who's interested in our data streams and the predictive ability, um, our findings from our previous research paper. Um, it is still a research study, so we're um, prospectively kind of confirming the results that we found in our um, prior um, retrospective study, which we are hopeful that we will um, find similar results. Okay. And Inder, what, what would you say that you would like to see happen next? I mean, obviously, you can shove data at people all they want. Then what? Yeah, I mean, I think the research has to be done. The science has to be done. Like we've got to prove that it works. But in our experience, even once it's proven, there's a gap. And the gap is, in, in my experience, as an ex-public health person working with public health people, um, here in the United States, we have a structural issue. Um, there's two of them. One is that the actual funding for public health for people to look at novel new technologies in this area of early detection, and again, I hate using the word surveillance, but in surveillance, is very limited to a handful of groups at the federal government. Those are the ones that are equipped to evaluate this. Local public health and state public health agencies do not have the funding to evaluate this. That means the feet on the street, the people who really know their current local situation, do not have the, the, the resources and capabilities of evaluating this stuff. And that's a problem. Because if it's a small group of people who all think the same way, who've all been trained the same way, it's challenging. In my experience, 
uh, and this, is, this goes well beyond the United States to, to international, public health traditionally thinks about drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines. They should. Those are proven techniques. But we also need to get smart about how do you talk to people who are still in the home before they ever enter the healthcare system? How do we use 21st century technologies to do things like create real-time warning systems, which we've never had the capability of past, in, in the past? And in my experience, it's too small, limited of a group of people who are not thinking about technology in that way. And we need to make sure that the funding goes to state local agencies that can start evaluating these kinds of things, not just at a research level, but an actual implementation level so they can use the data for effective impact. We've tried and run into brick walls for six and a half years showing real peer reviewed publications. And now I think is the time where where, where the doors are opening to start doing this kind of stuff. You know, if I, if I might make an editorial comment, we weren't ready in the United States. We were not ready. Singapore was ready. Taiwan was ready. South Korea was ready. Why were they ready? Because they got hit by pandemics in the last 20 years. 2003 SARS, 2009 swine flu. They were ready. My hope is that this just goes away and it doesn't kill as many people as the projections are out there. Because next time, next time, I hope we're ready. Okay. Dina, you used to work in an advocacy role at Consumers Union. I know now you may not be thinking about this as much, but what is, how do you bridge that gap between we have data and we take action? I think that one thing that I always go back to is that public health departments across the United States are struggling under the amount of funding that they have and the resources they have available. Um, so I do agree that the public health departments do tend to rely on tried and true practices that have been effective in the past, but aren't adopting new technology and new opportunities. On the flip side, we need to acknowledge that um, their, their staffing that they have is frequently limited and they're not able to bring on new employees. Um, so that's one issue. And I think that what we should be doing now is figuring out how technology can partner with departments of public health to augment the practices that, that they've had in the past, but leveraging new technology. So contact tracing is a great example where contact tracing has always been around, it's always been allowed. Um, and to a limited extent, it has been effective. Uh, but we can't do contact tracing in the same traditional manner when we're talking about COVID-19, just it's pure numbers. And so technology will be um, extremely helpful in that regard. I think the other thing that we need to remember is that, like I was saying at the top of the hour, the technology that we have available to us is not all streamlined. So the way that we're measuring pulse ox is not going to be measured the same on the same part of the body, depending on what technology we're using the ranges of normal are not gonna be exactly the same for each device. So even as we're partnering with the departments of public health, we need to make sure that they understand what the differences are in this technology. We don't want to overlook something that actually would have been a signal. We don't want to overreact to something that turns out was just a difference in measurements. And so it's a question of strong communication with departments of public health hearing from them what it is they need from technology, but also partnering with Department of Public Health to get them to understand that there's things from technology that can actually make their jobs easier and more efficient. Um, then when we go back to what I was saying about, uh, about funding, that just, again, going back to the government, we need to fund our public health system and we need to better develop our healthcare system in general. Okay, so it sounds like, hey, more funding, education at the local and I would say even federal level for public health, but a focus on letting localities handle this data and use it to start bubbling up information to relevant parties, it sounds like. So you guys, it is time for the Q&A portion, and there are lots of really great questions coming in. I would ask that if you're going to ask a question drop it in the Q&A so I can, that is where I'm looking for them. So I'm just gonna kick it off with, uh, with, with a question from the audience. Um, okay. 
Oh, I'm, I'm coming. I, I had one. Okay. This is from Stan Romero. He wants to know if the data is different for COVID-19 versus seasonal flu and colds, et cetera. And this is probably for both Dina and Inder. So Inder, can you tell the difference? Yeah, the way we do that is we remove what we would expect from cold and flu on the local level. How do we do that? So we have a forecast for flu-like illness that we've developed over the last eight years where we fingerprint every location in the country using millions of users. That forecast today allows us to predict cold and flu 12 to 20 weeks out on a city by city basis. That is currently under peer review. It's been under peer review for a bit, um, but there's hopefully a med archive paper for those researchers that will be published sometime soon. I've been waiting for three weeks for them to get it up on the, on the website. Um, so we remove that forecast from the, the symptom data that's coming in through our thermometers and app. We remove it. What's left over is a residual. What's left over is unusual. And that's how we say, ah, oh, something unusual is going on here. Send the test kits in. Send the virologists in. That is, a, that is an indicator of an unusual illness. Today, that unusual illness, and I showed you that map at the beginning, um, is COVID-19. Uh, it's, that's a black swan event in our data. We've never seen something that crazy in terms of atypical illness. We have seen small blips, right? A, a really weird flu B strain is what we trace it to eventually. But the whole idea here is you have a non-specific outbreak detection system. You want a non-specific outbreak detection system, not a pathogen specific one. You want a non-specific one so you can say, ah, it's like a light bulb going off on the map saying, send the test kits in, send the virologists in, figure out what's going on. Um, and so, so that's how we do it. Is we remove out the signature of cold and flu on a location by location basis. Jennifer, Dina, any? Yeah, I would just jump in and say that I think that what Inder was describing, the measures are the same. So you're, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, a fever is a fever. And so the way the thermometer is going to work is the same way. It's the question is, what are we doing with the data? So first we need to figure out, is having a fever relevant for COVID-19 early monitoring? I think many of us are going to say yes. And so to the question of, um, are the measures different? The measures are not different. It's how we are learning to use those measures to create a picture of what's happening. Okay. Um, let's, there's been a couple questions and a common theme among them is data standards. So, there, there's questions like, Kinza, do you provide an open API so people can access and pull this in? Um, but a broader question might be, as, you're, as we're trying to gather all of this data in, how do we, whose role is it to make it intelligible and accessible for people to understand? I think it's all of us, right? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think we just need to do the, the good research and, and where it comes from, whether it's a research group or it's a company, I mean, we need to publish the science. So when you're publishing your science, is it, do you have like an API that people can, pull, well, do you have an API that people can pull from? Do you uh, have a way to, so they can replicate it, you know, yes. best practices? Okay. Yes, we do have an API. There are terms that we have around it for public health right now. It's very basic. You can go to a website and it's a two paragraph thing and you just sign up and you get it. So that's how we're doing it in the current crisis. Um, we want to make sure it's accessible. Okay. By the way, none of that's de-identified data. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. Um, Dina, this is actually a question for you. Um, she wanted to under, or this person wanted to understand the difference between data rights and individual privacy rights that you were trying to make a distinction about. And I don't know if you want to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, this is something that's kind of evolving, but what we've traditionally talked about is privacy. You think of a lot as, I want my privacy, close the door, you don't get my information. A data rights is more of an understanding that it, it may be that I am comfortable sharing my information with my doctor and with my partner and perhaps um, with some other location, but I don't want that information shared with person BCD. And so under data rights, that says, I as the individual have the following right to limit how my information is going to be collected, used, and shared. And I should also be able to say after a certain period of time, I want my data deleted. 
And I should also be able to see the data that's collected about me and make corrections to it, or at least make annotation to it. So it's just a, a more um, evolved way of thinking of privacy. So we're no longer thinking of privacy as just uh, either shut the door or keep the door open, but something more along the lines of data rights, where I have the right to the following thing, and I should be able to have um, control over it. And that's where data governance is the term that's used. Got it. Sorry, this is, I, I neglected to think about how difficult it is to read questions and um, um, also pay attention to this. So this is tough. Um, okay, final question. This is, this is a good one I like. What devices, what data isn't available to you for tracking disease, possibly COVID-19, that you would like to have available to you? What, what would be a holy grail? What kind of things are we not tracking that might be helpful? anyone. This might be even good for Jennifer because. Yeah, so our um, research app can actually pull in um, any health kit or Google Fit data. So we can actually pull in, um, if someone has a connected thermometer, we can pull that data into our study as well, or blood pressure, weight data. And I think all these different data streams coming together will help improve our models. Um, but I think the one missing piece is the lack of testing in the United States. So um, lots of people are self-reporting symptoms, but we, they still might not know whether they have um, COVID or flu or some other respiratory virus. And having that testing data will, um, is, is definitely important for um, really getting to that next step of validating our models. Yeah, I think it depends on what your purpose is too here. And I want to emphasize that. Are you trying to diagnose an individual or are you trying to detect an outbreak at a population level? And these are two very different things, right? And, you know, biometric data on common illness issues, uh, temperature, heart rate, et cetera, are really, really valuable. The two or three challenges are scale. Right? How do you get a lot of people to use those, to, to contribute those things? And two, timeliness. How do you get a lot of people to contribute those things within hours of a symptom onset or an illness? Those two things are very, very hard to do. Um, and so that's the kind of scale that you're gonna want for outbreak detection, to be able to see at a population level what's going on and how it's used. And, and the more and more we can start thinking about great user experiences that wrap a warm hug around people that are not creepy. One of our user experience <laughs> principles is don't be creepy, right? And I say that on every customer call. Um, we have employers coming to us frequently saying, I wanna monitor the health of my employee population. I'm like, your intent is great, but you have gotta re recognize no one's gonna give you all their health data, right? Um, so don't be creepy, do it in a way that wraps a warm hug around people. And if you can get that, then we can create an early warning signal. But timeliness and scale are really critical and if you can get some of that early warning biometric illness data with scale, with timeliness, we're gonna be in a much better place. Dita, anything that you would like to see? I'm gonna leave it to the researchers here to talk about what they wanna see. My there you go. Is making sure that the technology people choose to use is accurate, is right for the purpose that they're using it and has the data rights that the individual should have. Awesome. All right. Well, here is here is where the void is going to give you a big round of applause and thank y'all very much for coming and sharing your knowledge with us. As a reminder, the this recording will be live at stacyoniot.com slash events. So you can see this all again, if you would like, or for the very first time. And I would like to just everybody big round of applause. Yay. Thank you. Oh, any final words I should ask before, before leaving? Thank you for having us. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent COVID-19 IOT party, y'all. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>